Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the keynote presentation of today. Uh, I want to briefly introduce uh, Felix Schürmann, who is an adjunct professor at the EPFL in, in Lausanne, and he is the computing director of the Blue Brain project, which aims to uh, create a digital reconstructions of, of the mouse brain and is a uh, kind of as a personal note, one of my kind of favorite large scale science projects at the moment. And uh, so Felix is a physicist. He studied in, in Heidelberg and uh, later got his PhD also from Heidelberg under uh, Karl-Heinz Meyer. And uh, what I found super cool is he has his, as his PhD project, he was actually working on a, on a hardware implementation of uh, neural networks. And well, without further ado, uh, Felix, we're looking very much forward to your talk. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Ulrich, for this really nice introduction. Thank you for the, to the organizers for the invitation. Um, I think I can share. Let me set this up first and then officially say good afternoon to everybody. Can you see my presentation? That looks good. Yes, we excellent. Can. Well, so good afternoon, everybody, and really thank you very much for uh, having uh, having me. Um, I actually find it exciting to um, that the topic of digital twins allow us to group science and engineering experts across many disciplines and talk about the type of of systems and we're we're modeling, which I think is rare. Normally, we speak to our own community because sort of that's sort of what our science is about. But I think this opportunity of, or this name or the subject of digital twins allow us, allows us to sort of look at a little bit further. So I'm really excited to be here. So um, I will be speaking in, about digital twins in basic neuroscience. And I guess sort of this uh, notion of digital twins really is, uh, is close to the original definition used in the, in the workshop that essentially we're talking about digital replicas of real life systems across all scales and including structure and, and function. And sort of in this case, we're talking about um, the brain. Now, um, to put this all in a little bit bigger picture is um, at least when I um, talk to a more uh, non-tech savvy audience, I think it's, it's really interesting to kind of paint this timeline of modern computing or computing and uh, general uh, computing in the first place, which really is sort of the, the advent of, of first general programmable electronic computers uh, after the Second World War, and how with each decade of um, uh, progress in that technology, um, we could um, use this, this tool for more and more um, applications, in fact. And while the early computers were were big pieces of, of technology. So they weren't doing a whole lot of computations um, per second, a few thousand uh, uh, computations per second. Um, and this 70 years of um, history, technology history is really is unparalleled, right? I mean, uh, the, the, this factor of, um, of uh, like 10 to the power of 14 um, over the 70 years from the first computer to today. Um, it's just, um, I don't think we've seen that in any other technology. And uh, again, if you were uh, going to the, uh, the bus uh, in a, at a leisurely speed at your bus stop uh, 70 years ago, uh, you would be now um, running to the, or getting to the bus uh, stop uh, a million times light speed. I mean, in the, in the, in the constrained physical world, such an increase in capabilities really has not happened. So in that sense, it's, it's unique. And I think it offered um, so many disciplines um, to jump on that train and profit. And really in the beginning, it was calculating trajectories of, of artillery um, shells. And then sort of we could actually start to apply it for, um, for um, larger mechanically interacting systems. We could apply to fluids. We could uh, do some computational chemistry. Um, we could do numerical weather prediction. And of course, I think in a way, a, a key moment in all of this is this nuclear stockpile stewardship that sort of we trusted these simulations in a way that at least um, most nations could um, maintain the threat of their nuclear weapons working by proving simulations and not having to actually 
explode real weapons. And that kind of um, shows that um, sort of these simulations can really get very accurate uh, in many ways. Um, and so as with every decade, with every factor, 100 to 1,000 in increase uh, of computation capabilities, more and more jumped on that. We have climate models and we have speakers of that um, in this conference, the digital twins, computational medicine. We now are really in this era of recasting um, all our problems as machine learning problems. I guess we'll talk about that in the panel. And so in a way, what's absent is, is neuroscience. And um, what the Blue Brain project that started, uh, was founded by Henry Markram, who was the director of the project about uh, 16 years ago, um, really was this idea of bringing this technology to neuroscience and helping us um, complement experiment and, and, and theory uh, up at the time. So we've been in the last 15, 16 years, we've been really trying to wrap our head around um, how we can use this technology to um, do replicas of, of brain tissues. And that's what I'll be talking about. Now, why did it take so long for neuroscience to jump on this train? Well, I guess part of that reason is that um, the brain is complex. And um, it is complex in the sense that it uh, really spans many orders of magnitude of, of structural spatial organization. It spans many sort of magnitudes of, of time. I'll come to that. But really, at each of these levels, we see sort of structures that sort of are seem to be worlds by its own, right? We have molecules, they form cells, there, there are synapses that between the cells, these cells form microcircuits, these microcircuits form brain regions. Um, and by the time you go to the doctor and you say, hey, I feel felt dizzy the other day, right? Sort of somehow something might have gone wrong in the system. Other parts of the system might have compensated all along. And so it is really not obvious where you should pinpoint um, function and, and, and a dysfunction. So really what we are faced with as neuroscience as a discipline is that sort of we become, we have this diversity we actually, um, our experts kind of study parts of that and putting it all together is really one of the biggest challenges. Now, um, I was alluding to these scales, right? And I just, I mean, um, want to, want to uh, illustrate that a little bit more. So if you look from proteins, molecules that sort of, of course, are from, uh, made out of atoms to what the structure of the brain, each of one of us has one, so this is spanning something like nine orders of magnitude of, of spatial um, uh, dimensions. And that's, of course, just the, the one dimension. You have to kind of do that in, in three dimension. And um, at the same time, time is a very critical thing. We live um, maybe close to 100 years if we are lucky. But sort of the chemistry um, that is happening at the level of, of neurons and in the synapses is, of course, much faster. So in a way, we have a biophysical and biochemical system that is made out of all these interactions over very, very long timescales. And that by itself, of course, is computationally speaking, a huge challenge. So we're looking at these nine orders of magnitude in space, which in a way you have to do uh, to the uh, power of three, right? Because essentially it's a three-dimensional system. And depending on which type of uh, equations you have to solve and how you have to integrate them, you may have to uh, deal with 18 orders of magnitude in, in time dimension, which of course you could argue that the time is harder to compress because I mean, that's sort of what you have to do serially um, in a way. So there's a, a weak scaling problem in this, which is sort of bigger computers will help, but we also have a strong scaling problem that in a way we would like to have faster computers and computers don't seem to get faster anymore, at least not uh, when you talk about serial um, uh, performance. So that is uh, an underlying challenge. So we're, um, we, we try to actually uh, um, still um, sort of try. And um, it was obviously not so easy when we started Blue Brain. Our community wasn't all ready to, to, to believe that sort of um, simulation of this biophysical and biochemical detail is a good thing. And partially, I think it's because we are actually not always saying what are our real intentions when we say we would like to understand the brain. So in a way, you could argue that there's certainly a camp of, of scientists and, and practitioners that say, well, I look at the brain because I think that intelligence is an algorithm. And I would like to sort of capture this algorithm because I want to build intelligent systems. 
And there's another camp of people that says, well, um, probably the evolutionary details in the brain matter. That sort of all these diverse cells and these connections, well, um, they might be there for a reason, or better to say, if uh, a disease might just not respect the fact that sort of, uh, what you're interested in is about intelligence, because it just sort of creates a mutation that might somewhere in these different scales and modalities have an effect. And of course, if you are into understanding the cause of this disease, then these details probably matter. But you can also put this sort of, the, there's one part of the, of the practitioners that really would like to sort of see, I would like to put this on the back of an envelope calculation. I would like to be able to write down the equations of what is uh, uh, intelligence and, and cognitive functions. Um, and that's sort of what I expect. And we've seen some of these successes, right? Some of our uh, uh, deep neural networks are fairly simple equations. Now you can't write down all the uh, all the parameters um, um, of these uh, modern deep neural networks on the back of an envelope, but the math is fairly simple. Of course, it's kind of misleading. I mean, you add a third body to this uh, two body problem, you can still write down the, the equations but you no longer can find a closed analytical solution. So we actually, you need to resort to, to integration and now sort of the math already gets a little bit more involved because you have to, to all have all these uh, algorithms that, that help you integrate. And in a way on this right-hand scale, um, you have maybe sort of things like uh, climate models where um, you have a lot of math, but you also have a lot of parameters, right? I mean, it matters. Um, how deep the lakes are, how high the mountains, and sort of uh, uh, which where the water flows and where not. And uh, it's sort of the, the matter of the fact is that sort of, um, in a way, this analogy shows you, well, if, I mean, some people would like to describe certain observations about the brain with simple equations, with less uh, heterogeneity, and sort of others are looking after the heterogeneity because they think that they need to be included. And in neuroscience, we have all of those um, different um, uh, uh, sort of personas, if you wish. And um, part of the, the heated discussion in our field actually come from the fact that sort of we are not always clear uh, what is it we want to model. But if we talk about digital twins and these replicas of, of biophysics and biochemistry of the brain, we are clearly on the right-hand side of the spectrum. Um, and that's sort of um, what, uh, what I'll be talking about. Now, this is just one example, really, why looking for this uh, or accounting for this uh, level of detail um, may be actually a good idea. Um, now, this is um, uh, a mechanism. Sort of, uh, we, I picked one, I mean, you could pick many others, which is called long-term plasticity. So it's the brain's ability to, to learn and to change um, over time, essentially, to become better at something that's that's rewarding, right? And uh, we we all went through that uh, in our lives. That sort of there's a certain behavior that's good for us, and we we want to have more of that. And then sort of our brain seems to get better at predicting what's the right thing to do. Now you can look at this point as as this mechanism as a as a as a function as a uh, something like. Maybe I can uh, teach a, a deep neural network with back propagation what I want it to do, but the brain does it differently. Right? In the brain, um, this long-term plasticity sort of happens in the connections between two types of neurons, right? So that you have a neuron that sends an axon uh, to the other neuron. There's a synapse being formed at that intersection. And so these synapses get manipulate or sort of change with the um, with a, a reward that you're giving to the to the organism. And what it means is now suddenly that change manifests itself in sort of how many ion channels sit in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron, the, the receiving neuron. And sort of suddenly all which neuron connects to whom with how many synapses and how many ion channels there are, how strong is the synapse, all of that matters for this um, long-term function. Now, the interesting thing is that this, the change happens on the one hand on, the, on this receiving neuron, but um, at the same time, the, the sending neuron can also change. It might actually decide to detach completely from that neuron, not talk to it anymore and talk to some other neuron. Now, suddenly, sort of, you have to actually see and look how both of these neurons in this network actually react to, um, to the reward 
over a long time period, right? And sort of where I just kind of randomly picked, I mean, there's uh, several orders of magnitude of space, several order of magnitude of, of time constants that you will have to bridge to actually understand the, the biological mechanisms of this learning. Now, again, you might find a simpler algorithmic way to have the effect of learning in, a, in, a, in an artificial neural network, but if you want to study how the brain is doing it, you will have to look at that, that heterogeneity. And for example, a disease might be that, wait a second, <laughs> that this particular type of neuron involved in this process actually might have a variation that sort of um, makes it fail to adapt. And therefore sort of, of course, you may have to study it for, for these real world scenarios. Now, <laughs> I found sort of a, a funny picture, which of course, in a way doesn't do any justice to um, modern um, digital twins, but in a way it illustrates or conveys the idea that um, in some or quite a lot of our engineered systems, we do know the pieces. And we know the pieces because we engineered them, right? Whether we built them by hand or we, nowadays we built them in the computer first before we built them in real, but we can account for all the parts. We even know the materials. And then our challenge with digital twins is of course, putting them all together, seeing how they work together. What are the governing equations for their interactions? And then maybe finding how the real world, right? How the wear, wear and tear have affected these pieces, right? To make a copy of that uh, Volkswagen Golf, which I think we're, we're seeing here. Now, um, in neuroscience, it's more like this. You'll find one that says, oh, I think I've seen like the analogies of a Golf 20 years ago, uh, but I didn't take a picture at the time, but I have a hand-drawn sketch of that Golf, right? Or of that neuron or of that synapse. The other scientist says, I have one, but I can't share my results with you quite yet because essentially I haven't published it yet. You might have somebody tell you, you know what, I, I, I looked at these things, but I took a different color because it was, uh, was easier to come by. So essentially I have something, you look where there's light, but not at the thing you actually were interested. Um, then your colleagues will debate, maybe that's not a class by itself. The other says, do you really need all these pieces? And uh, one you have one saying that sort of, oh, I looked at it with another modality and it's much more complicated than the couple of hundred pieces we saw on the other side. So in our domain, our challenge is that we do not know the pieces that go into the, the system and thus into the replica we want to build of it. And the reason for that is kind of li lies in the complexity of the brain and in a way in its inaccessibility. And this is a, a picture taken from Terry Sosnowski's um, uh, article from 2014. And what you see here is um, on two um, scales, on the one end it's the spatial scale, which in a way is sort of uh, similar to these nine orders of magnitude I've been showing you uh, just a while ago. And here are the time scales. And uh, what is plotted here are the, the um, uh, range of application of certain experimental techniques that can be used to study the brain. Um, for example, you have here fMRI imaging. So fMRI, functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging, can have a resolution of maybe uh, a second uh, resolution and sort of you can actually monitor changes over let's say a couple of, of hours. And on the other hand, it's resolution spatially so it doesn't go beyond uh, below a millimeter, but you can scan the entire brain. Now, if you actually have an electron microscope, you can go much, much more in detail in terms of spatial resolution. Um, but one of the uh, side effects is that it actually will kill the specimen. So you can only do that uh, once on, on sort of uh, uh, brain tissue and essentially not on the living animal. So while we've seen here, so this is the year 2014, this was uh, in 1990, uh, 1988, you see physics, and medical physics has advanced a lot and actually has found new ways of probing the brain, fMRI, uh, TMS stimulation, uh, optogenetics. So we've been building more and more ways to interrogate the actual biophysical biochemical system. But the problem remains that we can't do it all at the same time. So what we have, what we're doing is we're looking at the brain, but we have to piece it together from many, many different observations. So we cannot apply all these techniques to the same brain. So we can apply it to many 
different animals. I mean, if we look at uh, certain species and, uh, and rat uh, rodents, for example, are used for that very matter that ethically it's, it's um, acceptable. Um, of course, you still have to justify it, but we can do a num many experiments. And for that, we actually can uh, aggregate um, our knowledge about the, the system, but essentially on some animals, we can do electron microscopy, <laughs> on others, we can do fMRI, on others, we can do patch plant. We can't do all of that for the same animal. So in a way, our data comes as a, as a, as a um, sort of synopsis of sort of many different animals. And if you have some idea for how different uh, we all are, even though we are all humans, we are all have different brains. There's not a single neuron the same in my brain as in, in your brain, and not a single neuron the same in my brain as it is in, in my brain itself. So uh, piecing this together from these multiple measurements, of course, is a non-trivial um, challenge. And it doesn't stop there. Um, because um, it is difficult to control all the different um, um, environmental parameters, um, sort of what I'm reporting here is, is not really the inability of, or the result of bad signs. It's just so it's not easy to control and there will be variability in the rodent and the mouse population uh, as well. But so by just taking a few of, of um, measured quantities, if you take, for example, cell densities, you might ask the question, do we actually know how many cells <laughs> are in the brain and how many are in the different parts of the brain? If you, if you look it up and if you go through the literature, you will find that um, the reports about the cell densities or the number of cells in a certain volume of a certain species, so we're talking about now uh, maybe a rat of uh, 14 days old um, of the same strain, that these numbers vary fourfold easily. We have more extremes. So that means some say we have 100,000 cells, the others say 400,000 cells. Now, what do you do, right? One publication says that, and the other one says, in our hands, it's this other value. And if you just look at it as a, from an experimental point of view, there's not much you can do about it until you hope that maybe others measure the same thing, and maybe over time you get a consensus. But as a matter of fact, maybe part of that is actually the variability of the real, um, real world. Uh, we don't know. Or it's simply one lab miscalibrated its, its methods, right? So you don't really know. But that's uh, an issue. That's all the numbers are, even if you have numbers, they're just really um, uh, large variability. We have data which is simply missing morphology. So these are your nerve cells. Um, uh, a rat, a mouse has 70 million of those. Uh, the human brain has 100 billion of those. And if you look for those cells, the data is simply completely incomplete. We might have in the mouse brain maybe uh, um, a, a percent or so of, of the neurons that should be there are measured in a way that we sort of even know how they look like. Um, and um, you can continue that story, ion channels, so these membrane proteins that actually make these neurons electrically active, um, they're just um, either not characterized. At some point, we didn't know that they were genetically identifiable. So some of the data is um, from uh, some time back is much more uh, um, coarse grained than today. And then what we do often in neuroscience, we measure where they're slight. What we mean by that is uh, essentially you do experiments in the, in the lab on, on brain tissue, and you do that at room temperature simply because your success rate is better. Well, um, in the brain, in the living system, the temperature is not at 21 degrees room temperature, it's at 37 degrees. So if you measure 21 degrees for things which are highly temperature dependent, that, that's an issue. Now, again, you can say, why did you do that? Well, the argument is that sort of if you do the experiment at 37 degrees, the, your success rate is much lower. So it would take much longer to do the data. So people measure uh, where they can measure. And that's also a reason why we choose animal systems like mat, uh, mice and, uh, and rat. It's not because we are super interested in, in rat and mice. It's just so the human brain is even harder to access, right? So we really study a proxy system because we can't study the system we're really interested in. And the story, um, continues. So the, the challenge we really have is that um, our experimental colleagues and our science, which we're doing, simply has not accounted for, for all the pieces. So if you are intending to build a digital twin, right, a replica of this system in structure and function, 
you're faced with the fact that the, the data is, is really fundamentally sparse. And we have to get to a dense model. And so how do you do that? And um, we have, over the last couple of years, developed our approach to that, which on the one hand, you have to look for rules, right? You hope to sort of find something that you can generalize. Um, that you really sort of have principles of how you can possibly augment this sparse data. And then we have, um, uh, you have, might have uh, inference, you might be able to say, look, we've seen in another species, I've seen that cell type, and maybe you can sort of take that principle from, from there. And we have found that actually, if you do algorithmically try to put this data all together in a digital twin framework, you can actually uh, make some uh, interesting um, predictions about what the data could be from the fact that they're uh, mutual constraints. So the data isn't random, but there's a lot of things that you can learn by, by putting different data sets in, and I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, so the Blue Brain project um, is, is about that. We are, have been for the last 15 years trying to put digital models at the center of our method, so where, where we which you would have data, which we organize as some of our previous speakers have, have talked about provenance, we want to really sort of get a handle on where this is coming from. We would use that data to build models of neurons, of cells, of synapses, of, of connections. We then actually would have a digital twin, which sort of you would hope to have as one that is a replica and that you can use to do experiments in silico, which you will have, to, of course, to validate and then at the end sort of try to make predictions for the real world, which might help you to uh, do better experiments or look for something else and sort of find really um, sort of hypotheses um, for, for certain observations that you've made in the real world, but which you couldn't explain. But it's, it's um, a methodology and I want, really want to sort of um, in my talk give this perspective that it's not just using the twin to do a prediction about the real world, but it's actually helping us, in our opinion, to do the science better. Because otherwise, as I said before, if you just have experimental observations which are disparate, um, how actually, what's the mechanism to, to bring them to, to negotiate what's the real observation? And we believe that this digital twin, putting it into these replicas actually helps you because at that point you have to face that the four times higher cell density actually has a consequence on many other levels and it's something that you can test. So the Blue Brain project is um, a Swiss national infrastructure project. It's funded by the ETH board, implemented at EPFL, and we are today about 150 people, scientists and engineers. About half of us are engineers and about half of us are, are scientists. Now, I promised you that I would give you some examples of sort of how you can computationally or how you can, can address some of the sparsity. One of the things is you can simply do more systematic experiments. So this is filling the gaps. And we started early on in our project, a channel project. So this is one of those ion channels. It's this protein it sits in the membrane of a cell and lets different ions selectively pass from the inside out or the outside in. If you actually look at that, there are about 350 ion channels um, known in, in, in animals and about 100 or in mammals and about 150 of these types are actually voltage gated. Now, the majority of these types are actually found in the brain. So there's a lot going on in our brains. And um, of those, none of those were, or very few of them were studied in a way that you could do computational models of. So we launched into a project to systematically clone every single one of these ion channels, which means you have to get the gene, you have to get a system, where you can then express that gene in exactly one cell line. So you create a cell line that expresses KV11, KV12, KV13. And then sort of for each of these cell lines, you, you generate uh, cells. You have an entire library. So we can go to the library, get a vial. And so, so in this thing, there are cells that are expressing just this one channel, uh, channel so that we can actually do industrial scale measurement of those channels and then get enough data so that we can do model fitting um, and sort of have computational models of this, not just at room temperature, but at uh, body temperature close to 37 degrees. And this has been a decade long project that sort of is showing its fruits. And uh, we make this data available and the models available and have some very interesting findings because now that you have that library, you can actually check sort of what 
uh, what certain drugs to do to these different ion channels and so on. And it's quite surprising because um, there's a lot of um, drugs that claim that they are not uh, changing certain ion channels. But if you have this, uh, if you test them against the, such a precise library, you, might, you actually may be quite surprised. So I think we'll see some surprises as to sort of why certain drugs might have side effects on others because you actually, they weren't really systematically tested before. Now this is sort of filling gaps traditionally in the sense that sort of this is how um, you simply do more systematic experimentation to get more of the pieces that you know are there, but you don't know exactly how they're characterized. Maybe computationally more interesting is um, sort of now that you have the channels. So these neurons, they look like trees and they actually, they can conduct electricity and they have these membrane um, proteins that allow uh, currents to flow in or out off the neuron, which then creates this electrical behavior, the action potentials, the spike. So they, they talk in electrical language. Um, and then sort of this language travels down, the signal travels down the axon and then forces um, the presynaptic terminals of the, of the synapses to release neurochemicals, which then sort of create this synaptic event on the other neurons. Now, what uh, is true when you look at cells in this level, they have all these different channels, which we previously said, not all the neurons, all these channels, but a good subset. And, but these channels sit all over this membrane. And that actually is even harder a piece of data to get. So where to know where, which density, certain types of channels are sitting on the different types of neurons. Now, mathematically that relates to that sort of in this equation. So it's a cable equation and the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, which kind of describe phenomenologically how these ion channels open and close. You need to know the conductance. You need to know how much of these channels sits everywhere in that neuron. And um, that's data, which is essentially impossible to get at the current state of experimental affairs. So we had to resort to um, how do you actually build uh, models for 70 million uh, uh, neurons of the mouse brain. And uh, when we started, this was a hand-tuned process, and we um, developed early on computational methods that um, in a way would be very systematic to prescribe as much of the problem from data, and then only open the difficult to measure parameters for an, an optimization for which we then devised a multi-objective optimization and a feature-based fitness metric. And um, I don't want to go into the details, but essentially, so this is now a real world experiment of a neuron sort of measured at different parts of the dendrite, extremely hard to do experiments. But so if you see that actually there are some non-trivial um, effects um, happening in the different parts of the neuron and our models today, we can automatically generate, they actually recreate the same electrical behavior um, of the experiment. And so this has been a major um, change that sort of it is now in a way an automated process that sort of with a certain type of data, we can generate these digital twins of individual nerve cells. Now, this is just to give you an example. So this has been widely used. We've been applying this to um, neurons of, of, uh, of the rat, of different brain areas. And quite interesting, we've been able to sort of apply this also to quite some unique data on human neurons. I've been talking so much about the rodent. I mean, the rodent is our main, main workhorse. But there is some rare tissue from tissue dissections of people that have epilepsy that are not drug treatable. And then sort of the, the last resort of the um, medical intervention is to extract a part of the brain, which is actually the source of this epileptic seizure. These things happen in hospitals, have nothing to do with research. But um, ethics uh, boards have approved that sort of that tissue, if the patient uh, approves, can then be put on eyes, moved to the lab, and so it can be studied a little longer. I mean, you can keep these cells alive for, for a day or so. So we have for the first time actual live recordings from human cells. And so we can build computational models of them. And it's quite interesting in which uh, ways they're similar to rodent cells and which ones are different. So in that sense, sort of this part of our digital twins, the neurons, um, we, we have under, under a good, good control. But you can move your um, your your focus of, of the problem further on, um, where you sort of say, now um, that we can build models of neurons, do we actually know what neurons are there and how many are there in the different parts? And this is a, um, a mouse brain. Um, 
It's, as I said, it's about a thousand times smaller than the human brain. It doesn't have these convolutions of the cortex, so it's a flat uh, structure here. Um, but still, it has pretty much the same um, brain structures as we see in all other mammals and the human as well, the neocortex. It has uh, cerebellum, hippocampus, thalamus, it has all the parts um, that mammalian brains have. So you can actually break this down. And now you sort of break this down into the different areas. The first question you can ask, so what types of cells do you have in all these different parts? And um, if you do that, the answer is just uh, very set after about 120 years of modern neuroscience experiments. And uh, this is a, uh, it's a well-funded um, science. So there's a lot of experiments happening um, for the most part. So this is just essentially a, a kind of a representation of sort of for which of these areas do you actually find literature telling you what types of cell there? I mean, the majority of it is, is great. That means for all of these hundreds of brain regions, you simply have no published result about what's in it. Um, and we have some areas that are more and well studied. Cortex is, is, is one of them. Uh, thalamus and, and, and cerebellum are others. And the reason is sort of they're, they're interesting, again, from the function. I mean, the cortex, of course, the part which we believe is the home of our cognitive abilities. Um, but that doesn't mean that all these other hundreds of brain areas aren't important. It's just they haven't been studied, right? And, or studied and not reported. So if you actually rely on literature telling you what, what the pieces are, um, for the most part, you draw a blank. And that probably will not change because the, the reward system in science is, of course, you should publish something new. Few get rewarded for doing the homework for the other brain regions. So the most interesting studies published in nature are those that you apply new technologies to a new part, but doing the same experiment to other parts is actually not very rewarding. So in the way we've set up in neuroscience is that we are actually not getting or we are not filling these blanks. Um, and that probably will remain like that. So um, what we've done is because we didn't want to content ourselves with that, we actually said, well, thanks to um, some other um, data sets um, uh, uh, spearheaded by the Allen Institute in Seattle, which is founded by Paul Allen, which decided to do an, an industrial scale uh, approach to neuroscience, um, not to replace neuroscience, but sort of to go after a few data sets that are, are worthwhile. So they actually um, decided to put sort of almost a conveyor belt science system where they sort of not just do one mouse experiments, but they do hundreds of mouse experiments, put them to a pipeline and actually slice these brains, stain these cells and sort of um, make this uh, data freely available, which is extremely great. Um, but sort of it's, it was, it's published as a data source. Now, if you want to use this as, a, as the parametric entry to your digital twin, you actually have to ingest that data, which really means you have to do alignment of the actual stains because every brain is different. There's a mechanical process of slicing and staining, and you have to align these things. You have to um, distort, uh, fix the distortions. But sort of if you do this all right, you can actually sort of get to a spatially located prediction of cell types. And we've done that. So we have a public resource where sort of we, we allow you to uh, have a human or a machine readable interface. To, if you are saying, tell me, tell me any of these 700 brain regions and we'll tell you how many cells and what types of cells you will find. And we've been uh, um, extending that recently to do much better alignment using machine learning. Um, we integrate different data sets so that we actually get a better breakdown of what types of cells there are and actually make um, treat it as a, as a multi-constrained optimization problem. Sort of if this stain tells us that, that stain tells us that, make interpolations, we sort of tell you the most likely number of cells of that type is, is that. So we have now a computational prediction of this part, which actually sort of hasn't been measured or published on from these uh, wide data sets. And while this is a prediction, right, it's the best we have. It's this idea that you have sparse data, you have to somehow get to the input data for your digital twin. Now, um, so now we have essentially the channels, we have the cells, we have know where to put them. Um, and now how do they connect to each other? And that is even worse in the sense that connections in principle theoretically can scale with a square with a, a, a power of two of the number of neurons, right? Because every neuron could 
potentially connect to to every other neuron. Now, of course, it, in reality, that doesn't happen. But not only do they connect with each other, they actually send multiple connections in between two nodes. So it's not just nodes with an edge, but so there's multiple edges between a node, if you if you wish. And clearly, I mean, there again, just a fraction of that data is is actually experimentally characterized. So um, what we've done early on in the project, um, again, in this notion of from sparse to dense, we actually sort of found a way, now that we have the neurons, we know where they sit and how many of those there are, right? As we just as discussed before, we actually could establish who potentially could connect to the other one, right? We're using the structural shape of these neurons to actually say, hey, this one and this one actually could connect to each other. And now that sort of gives you a, a theoretically um, a sort of a space of uh, uh, almost um, of, of connections and sort of for the area we looked at. So we looked at this pinhead size part of the cortex of a young rat. That's sort of our digital twin target. We defined there some 55 types of cells. And so if you um, square that, that's sort of what would be possible. If you do the spatial, spatial overlap, you can narrow it down. And then so if you can calibrate that further with experimental data, and we actually come up with a prediction of who is likely going to connect to who, which of course you have to calibrate, right? As we sort of can we trust this digital twin. I mean, all of that actually has to be tested against some data which we didn't use in the, in the creation of that digital twin. Now, um, and why is that possible? How can we make this data more dense? Well, the point is that these things, as I said before, they're interdependent, right? They're not uh, independent. So if you have these cells, um, that essentially the more cells you have, the more of these spaghettis you will have because cells come with these dendrites axons. And the more of that, the more likely is that they meet in space that might increase the probability of connections. Um, and the number of synapses sort of is something you can measure independently. And sort of through that, you can actually find that it, maybe it's easy to measure this parameter and this, and essentially from that, you can deduce what the others should be. And this is really this puzzle piece of, it's not just having all the puzzle pieces, but it's sort of saying that if this puzzle piece is there, you know, another one has to be there. And this is really, I think, a key of, of what we've been uh, using and, and uh, uh, for building these digital replicas. So putting this all together, I mean, you have essentially a large machinery that ingests this data and, and creates these different components, validates them. And then only after a long process, we actually have this digital twin, which you can then use to actually do science with. And that's exactly what we've been doing. So in a way, this is one of our key publications from some years back where sort of we showed that you can build brain digital twins uh, of sort of brain tissue um, from uh, a sparse data. And so we could predict then using these digital twins, we could do a whole lot of, of things. But now this is just uh, a view of sort of how that looks like here. We are um, running a simulation. So we have now built all these individual cells. We've equipped them with a cable equation. We can um, simulate their digital, uh, so their electrical behavior integration, sending spikes. And this is just a, 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 a sub sampling of the actual density. Um, about a few percent of what's in the model. And sort of now you have that twin, you can actually take it for a run, uh, which I guess sort of normally is what you think about right away when you talk about digital twins. But so it took us all this, <laughs> this, this process to actually get to such a twin. Now, what we can do with that is we can do many things. So on the one end, we can really look at the tissue and sort of say um, what people have found is that um, if you look at the uh, real brain, so the activity is very asynchronous and sparse. And if you look at the brain in, a, in, in vitro, and also if you cut a part of the brain and study it in your Petri dish, um, then sort of there's this oscillatory behavior, which led scientists to believe, well, if you study the brain in the Petri dish, you will never explain how the awake living brain is looking like. Now, with the help of the model, we could actually track this to that it's actually probably related to the calcium concentration that is different in a living awake brain than in the Petri dish. Again, you look where there's light. In the Petri dish, you increase the calcium in order to keep the cells alive for longer, but uh, that changes their dynamics. Now we could predict that in the model. We could replicate that by putting brain slices on multi-electrode rays and really show that sort of um, what the model predicted you would see in the experiment. And I think it really helped the, the discussion about sort of 
um, what are the sort of that it's not two different systems, but it's the same system in different uh, dynamical states uh, that we're studying. We were able to do replicate actual experiments. Now, what do you do with a rat? Well, a rat has whiskers because they don't see so well. And then so that they, they explore the world by sort of uh, having the whiskers touch the environment. And um, people have uh, um, thought about fantastic experiments uh, sort of, of what happens if you deflect the whisker and where that shows up in the brain. And so this is um, a paper that sort of um, shows what type of activities you see when you actually deflect the whisker. And uh, in short, I don't want to turn into neuroscientists. I mean, some cells seem to be really uh, reacting to that whiskers. Um, that's on, on cells, others stop firing. <laughs> they don't. So this is time. This is sort of uh, the, uh, the, the histogram of, of, of spikes. So essentially, or the trials and sort of, I mean, if you don't see a dot here, that means of the cells didn't fire. So they're on cells, they're off cells and cells that don't care. And now you can actually do that experiment in silica or in your digital twin. And you see the same thing that sort of you will have cells that sort of react uh, on. You have um, uh, cells that are non responding, they don't really care. And maybe you have something like off cells, but sort of qualitatively, we could do that. It's not perfect. And that has probably uh, something to do that not all the parts relevant for that processing are in our model. We're actually looking into that. Now you can continue that, that uh, timeline and sort of say, oh, that narrative and say, this is. Um, something which is very interesting. If you hear uh, um, the following D, 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 um, your auditory cortex is picking up this deviant by sort of having a certain firing rate retreats to this, to this deviant. And you can now speculate why that is, but we could actually just replicate this, put auditory stimulus into our model and actually show that these things actually seem to be a general capability of cortex which just happened to be um, a result of um, a, a, a different um, combination of, of uh, physical effects. So the synaptic depression, frequency adaptation, and recurrent activity. And interestingly, it's, it's a non, uh, not just additive, but it's a, it's a super additive effect. So that, thanks to the model, you can now do an ablation study. You take these things out and you actually see how much of that remains. And it actually shows that this is, um, you need all of those things at work. And so this is really interesting because these things weren't put into your digital twin, right? We built it out of these pieces and by just exposing it to this in silica experiment, you actually can um, uh, explain um, or you, it, it generates some of the behaviors found in the experiment. And then of course you can use it to do a systematic um, dissection of your model. Now, the last type of experiment here is sort of um, brain signals. Um, we found molecules that um, that are sensitive, so that change their progression depending on the on the potential. So we can genetically engineer that. We put these molecules into cell membranes, and that allows us to sort of um, study with the light source um, on the camera, sort of uh, activity or the membrane potentials of cells. Now this is great, and it's widely used. Uh, fantastic uh, innovation. But as a matter of fact, people didn't really know what, what they're measuring because well, as a matter of fact, this whole problem is how deep is the light penetrating into? So how much fluorescence you actually evoke? Um, how much of that fluorescence is actually leaving the tissue? Because you sort of, these are, of course, there's light scattering. Um, and then sort of by the time you pick up the signal, what actually is it you see? And to the model, we could actually decipher that the main contribution to what people see at the uh, surface of the, of the brain using this technique is are certain subtypes of neurons, which sort of wasn't known before, right? You, you think you, you sort of, you pick up everything, but as a matter of fact, it's a, there are certain parts of the tissue that dominate. So this, this idea of that we can have forward models of, of, of brain signals, whether it is logic sensitive dye, fMRI, um, EEG, you name it, sort of, this is really the strength of, of digital twins in neuroscience. And I think it will revolutionize sort of how we can use these signals in the clinic. Now, we've gone beyond um, the microcircuit. So this is what we've done 2015. Since we've applied that method to other brain regions, the thalamus, hippocampus, some of the sensory cortex, neocortex, and uh, come to that sort of how much costly that is. 
But this is just to give you a glance. I mean, it's just beautiful. So we now have digital twins, which are not just the size of a pinhead, but our entire brain regions. And uh, so this is the one which is going to be published hopefully fairly soon, but it's, it's a major piece of, of work. Now, I alluded to the fact that this is a computational challenge. Um, this were 30,000 neurons um, and about 180 million ordinary differential equations. Um, the model I just showed you are 4.2 million neurons, 10 billion synapses, uh, about uh, 50 billion ODEs. And so that we have models that are another factor of two bigger. So we're talking about 400 billion ODEs to, to solve at every time step. Um, for that, we've been um, investing heavily in high performance computing. We worked together with Michael Hines, who developed 30, who started 35 years ago a simulator. Uh, which would, is specialized for modeling these neurons and the biophysics thereof. When we started, this wasn't a parallel piece of software. And so the last 15 years, we really invested into making this piece of software run on the biggest parallel computers in the world that there are. Um, and so having to solve all the problems that come from such an increase in scale. And um, we've been really investing into extracting the computational core out of that speeding this up, reducing the memory, uh, and increasing the speed by orders of magnitude. We're using domain-specific languages to translate the, the equations that we want into the most um, optimized code tailored for a certain computer architecture, whether it's a CPU or a GPU or something else. And we've endeavored to really understand the computational costs of these models, sort of what part in the computer architecture actually helps us to um, solve these problems. Is it a network problem? Is it a compute problem? Do we need more of an, of an exponential uh, unit or do we need um, a faster memory? So we actually learn to understand, um, depending on the detail we're putting into our models, what is the ideal hardware platform that we uh, should, should be using. Now, um, it remains a computational grand challenge. So I have two logarithmic axes here. The bottom is the is the kind of the computational complexity. The y-axis is the memory requirements. And it's, it's a little bit qualitatively, but sort of you might need a megabyte for modeling a single neuron in this biophysical detail. Maybe in a gigaflop, you can do some science with it. And then you multiply this out. As I said, the mouse brain, 70 million of those neurons, the human brain, 100 billion. And in this logarithmic or double logarithmic plot, it doesn't look so bad. But sort of this was the fastest supercomputer in the world, 2005, um, 16 years ago. We've made more than a factor thousand increase in the world's fastest supercomputer in flops, not in memory. And the problem is we're kind of, we're falling flat on this curve. We build faster computers, but not computers with larger memory and higher memory bandwidth. So while when we started, the mouse brain wasn't in reach, so we knew it would be in reach. And today we have computers in our project that are actually capable of, of having enough memory for the mouse brain that we're falling orders of magnitude short of the human brain, at least for now, but probably also for some time to come. Now, this is just this level of detail that I've been alluding to. So this cellular level detail, if you're actually going to the chemistry in terms of memory requirements, in terms of um, uh, compute requirements, there are some hidden um, factors of several orders of magnitude that will keep this problem of digital twins of the brain um, quite an ambitious challenge for the probably generations to come. And just to, to end, um, sort of we have been endeavoring to integrate actually not just the neurons as we've been seeing, we actually sort of, uh, there's this other type of cells called glial cells that um, are the ones that sort of do, uh, provide these cells with energy they're responsible for the metabolism. There's the vasculature. If, so in this cubic millimeter, it's amazing how much um, blood vessels there are to supply these neurons with the oxygen and the sugar they need. And we've been putting this all together so that essentially we don't have just the physics of the cells, but essentially the physics of the interactions of these different types of cells, which of course is a, a chemical reactions of translating some molecules into others. We just published the structure of that. We're going to have soon have the metabolism um, published and the blood flow, which now essentially this digital twin will allow you to 
compute the bold signal. Well, this will be the bold signal you see in an fMRI in a cubic millimeter. So essentially that alone is, as I just said, will increase the computational complexity and the memory requirements. Um, currently sort of uh, this runs about 20 times slower than our cellular simulation. So it just gives you a hint for that this le level of resolution will be hard to um, maintain for um, the entire brain. Now to come to the conclusion, so digital twins in basic neuroscience for me really are um, a unique framework to integrate this multimodal and bulk scale data and allow us to sort of causally track from sort of the low scales to the to this, uh, signals we see in the brain. Um, we are faced with this major challenge of building these twins from sparse data. Um, and um, but we believe that sort of doing using these twins is actually exposing very clearly which data you have, which data you're missing, and how you maybe can sort of combine that data. And of course, then using these twins once you have them, I think is, is a, just a fantastic way to, to study the causal underpinnings of the brain's um, function and testing for hypothesis. A lot of what we do is, is open source and published, whether it's the software, the data, the models, um, and um, training material. And with that, I want to close. So this is how we looked pre-pandemic. This is how we look post-pandemic. So we are actually, so this was a meeting we just had the other day where sort of um, we're all working from home since pretty much um, uh, almost two years now. And with that, I thank you very much. Um, go check out our uh, uh, portal where sort of a lot of our resources um, are available. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Felix, for a really exciting talk on a, on a project that's uh, probably going to stay interesting for decades. So, uh, and I, I bet there's a bunch of questions here. Uh, quick look to, to Martin and Philip. Do we still have time for, for a few? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we do. So, and I, I see one question already from Ivo. I think Ivo was first, right? Ivo and Artwa. Yeah, good. Ivo, please. Thank you, Ulrich. Hey, Felix, thanks for the great talk. Hi, Ivo. Really impressive progress that I see since I visited you three years ago. Um, now that you include uh, the, the blood flow and metabolism, which of course in itself are huge topics. So which subset of the metabolome do you actually model? Uh, which subset has, let's say, uh, neuronally relevant activity and, and, and how do you model the blood flow? What level of detail do you need there in the fluid mechanics? I was fearing these questions and sort of this is uh, sort of, um, I, I will not be able to provide all the details. So one of the things for the, um, which part of the metabolism, um, we, we have a metabolism a model that has about 150 um, reaction types in it, which sort of, um, sort of there's this, um, uh, lactate glucose shuttle, which sort of really is essentially between stuff that's being picked up in the blood vessel, uh, transformed in the glial cells and then given to the neuronal cells. And so uh, we, we, what we did is we actually looked at a lot of systems, uh, biology um, data, because some of that is, of course, characterized in other cell types. Um, you realize that sort of there's um, some of that, these, these, the concentrations aren't sort of, it's not measured in the same concentration. So you have to kind of normalize all of those uh, equations. There's an issue that there's a, a, a lot of um, spatial obstacles in the, the neurons. So that sort of some of that actually isn't sort of happening as in an equilibrium as in, in other cells. So you have to kind of account for some of those aspects. And um, so it's, it's a tedious process of sort of, of course, piecing together. I mean, we, we don't do experiments on that metabolism ourselves. So we actually piecing this together from a lot of systems um, biology work. And um, so it's a subset of the metabolism, but still it's probably the most complete model there of um, um, at least sort of, uh, for, for the brain. And um, so for the blood flow, um, there we take it in stages. So as a matter of fact, that sort of, um, you can kind of um, connect your um, uh, metabolism model to a fairly rough. I mean, you kind of need to have a certain uh, flow rate of a certain um, blood vessel to kind of get an idea for how fast so these these metabolites flow by. Um, but it's it's a, it doesn't need to have a whole lot of detail. So currently, we're actually 
these glial cells that take care of about 100 by 100 by 100 micrometer type space. So one glial cell is sort of uh, dominating this entire uh, area. And so the blood flow right now is a relatively simple uh, model. So we don't need to model individual blood cells passing through capillaries or something. So in that sense, we'll get by probably with, with fairly um, simple flow models um, and so sort of don't need to do um, uh, too much for that. But I actually sort of, um, I'm, I, that's not yet um, completely solved. So I think we are actually, we, so a matter, matter of fact, we can do some of the metabolism calculations without even calculating the blood flow. We can kind of right. replace the blood yeah. flow with a fairly simple model. Yeah, the blood flow probably you can you can get along with a, 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 a kind of a you know a flux balance model, kind of a Kirchhoff exactly. model, right? Which is a fluxes on the edges. And then the question then always if you have if you have a finite cube of tissue, right? What are the boundary conditions? Like uh, at what rate do you put blood in and out from both sides? We had the same questions when we did the liver yeah, with Marino. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So I think uh, Art was next, right? Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much, uh, Felix. It was a very fascinating talk. Uh, I'm curious specifically regarding your channel, PD, uh, and, and the, the work that you've done there on understanding the potential side effects that are coming from the uh, channel interactions um, for, for putif, therapeutic compounds, as far as I understood. Um, have you been considering also taking it uh, a step further and perhaps formulate um, more advanced or improved conditions for clinical trials, for example, phase one safety trials, which would help improve, let's say, uh, sort of early detection of potentially non-working drugs or drugs with a poor safety profile? We're actually getting a lot of pushback on this library of, of um, cell lines with genetically identified ion channels. And Partially, there's some valid scientific debate because ion channels have these subunits, and so if we, we've been focusing on the homomeres, and then we have the heteromeres, and so it's it's clearly in real life even more complex. So we have not done yet cell lines for the heteromeres. So essentially, we we are modeling, or we have cell lines of a certain type of those. Now that said, um, we're really sort of we're pushing the boundaries of the temperature from 20 to 35 degrees, and we have many many cell. Um, channel types where people said this is a silent channel doesn't matter so therefore I don't even need to test it and they are not silent at room temperature they're not silent at, at body temperature and um, so we've seen all of that the community is really not very happy about that in the sense that sort of it's it's kind of challenges their their belief system and pharmaceutical industry is even less happy about it I mean right now there it's really sort of there um, I, I mean I think we should be open to that and I think as you sort of say it should be as early on I mean you can you can um, really put experimentally probe your compounds against that, or you can sort of computationally sort of check whether which of these channels actually is the most uh, sensitive one to do that. So I think it actually should be put uh, early on and through the entire pipeline to do that. I think we'll get there. We actually get sort of uh, people interested in, in sort of um, in that we, we you can use it for basic research to sort of do see how specific is your dye, right? People try to, to stain for certain types of channel. And so they actually didn't know, even know how specific the dye is or not. And so all of that can now be done. So I think we are, we are, we're getting there, um, but sort of it's an upward battle. I mean, they, <laughs> it's not very popular, surprisingly. For sure, for sure. I guess uh, any kind of bottom-up uh, type of approach is kind of difficult uh, to, to convince uh, people who work in, in clinics. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Arthur and Ivo, for your questions. Uh, I'm wondering, are there any more? And I actually also have two, two questions to, to, to Felix. So uh, do we still have time for that? I would say yes. So please, Ulrich, go ahead. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the questions is more like on an organizational thing. So uh, you mentioned you have at the moment around 150 people, uh, half, half scientists and engineers working for the project is this uh is this only like like uh, computational people or does this include the, the the wet lab people also are you getting your so other uh, stated otherwise are you getting kind of your all your wet lab data internally or are you reliant there on, on external collaborators no so we don't do any animal experimentation in blue brain we're a computational um, organization so we have um, other laboratories with which we collaborate so that 
do their work uh, independently of us, but sort of we have collaborations that we get some of the data um, sort of early on, um, or we take a lot of data from 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 published results. So um, of these people, we are essentially a computational um, um, organization. Okay, cool. And um, my my second question um, relates to the approach of of using like the, the samples from from epilepsy patients uh, as kind of data source. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm wondering about uh, two two things there. Um, so one is that the, the tissue that you usually cut out in, in these uh, um, epilepsy surgeries, you have a lot of tissue that's diseased there where the cells are not working properly. So uh, how, do you, how do you select there for, for working, working correctly working cells? I, 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 could, I mean, from my naive understanding, it's, it's often even for the pathologists very hard to tell even from histological samples, what's uh, kind of the problem? So how do you how do you figure out the good ones? Yeah, it's a it's a it's it's a key question. Of course, it's a very standard question. So um, the key answer is sort of um, these dissections aren't as precise as you would hope. I mean, they're actually quite microscopic pieces of brain being extracted just to be sure that sort of I mean the epileptic uh, center is being taken out. So uh, at the fringes of that, you do see tissue that by definition is sort of not affected, and you can compare that because the, there's another reason for doing these brain dissections and that's tumors. And so they're mm -hmm. the same thing there. It's a little bit easier to find the, the tumor cells uh, from the healthy cells. And by comparison from the cells you get from that tissue versus the cells from epileptic tissue, you can actually sort of draw with relative certainty that sort of the effects you're seeing aren't sort of because these are diseased cells, but they're healthy. It's, it's, however, it's a good point. Now, again, we, this community takes what, what you get. So, I mean, you can't ask yeah. the surgeon to do a bigger dissection and you can't actually, no, of course, it's, of course. <laughs> it's just, just uh, interesting. Um, that means so this tissue comes from certain parts of the brain because epilepsy is sort of focused in certain parts of the, uh, of the brain. So for some parts of the brain, we will never get that tissue unless sort of you're unlucky and have a tumor in that part, but they, they might not even sort of treat that. So as a matter of fact, the, the tissue samples we get from humans are again very selective and not sort of mm -hmm. nicely sampled all across the brain. That is, of course, a problem by itself. Okay, and uh, kind of along a, a similar line. So um, I, I think so. For for the moment, you are mostly focused on on uh, simulating kind of a working non-diseased brain. And I'm wondering what the what the potential is for actually doing not not the exact opposite, but kind of simulating. Uh, slightly diseased parts, like, for example, these epileptic foci? So, yeah, excellent question. I mean, now you see the multidimensionality of, of that, right? That's a weird, I mean, we're not even understand the healthy brain or whatever that means, but it's a healthy and normal brain. Um, that's of all the disease states. So I think um, that's going to be a, a huge, and not all diseases are of the same type. Now, the interesting thing is there are actually some epilepsy diseases that are can be tracked to single gene mutations but you know that actually that ion channel is being sort of mutated and it has a different things so i think these things will be in rate and reach the fastest because you actually can now that we have these channel models we can actually do that mutation computationally introduce that channel variant into the system actually see what comes out so it really have a forward model of those things i think these will be in range fairly directly now if you talk about diseases like alzheimer's which sort of uh, appear sort of late stage of your life and after 60 years of the tissue and compensating for it and happening sort of in between cells and you know whether this plaque is caused or a side effect those things will be extremely really much harder to to computationally model so i i think we we sort of um things where we can see the mutation see the effect i think are in reach the other thing is to that is we might be actually able to test um uh, um uh, med tech devices, so for example, uh, deep brain stimulators, things like that, sort of what should be the right frequency, where should you put these things, um, and you might be able to actually screen for some drugs that sort of might um, uh, use or um, stimulate already present mechanisms in the brain to sort of some uh, uh, cure. So again, we're not developing any disease, but I think sort of, I'm sorry, developing any, any, any treatments, and we are basic research, but you see sort of these parts where sort of the, the elements are in your model already and you have to sort of um, idea of how to change the parameters. I think those will be the, the parts which will be in reach first um, for this type of question. Okay, 
great. So uh, thank you very much, Felix. I hope everyone can still hear me because my computer is a bit laggy right now. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thanks for the thumbs up, Philip. So uh, I, I hand over again to, to Philip and Martin.